everything is working smoothly. Um, I'd just like to say a very quick hello and welcome to today's webinar, which is focused on the outlook for global energy and the road to COP26. Um, my name is John Harmon and I am the head of renewables over at Reuters Events. Um, and this is a part of our Future of Energy series, um, which will be running over the next couple of weeks. Uh, this is specifically focused around the energy transition, um, renewable technology, clean technology, and obviously a perspective on global energy as we move forwards. Um, if you would like to know more about what we're doing specifically, please do head to Google and search for Future of Renewables Reuters events. Uh, punch that into Google and you will be redirected to the conference. Um, but without further ado, I would like to hand over to our two presenters today. So we have Andrew Brown, who is a partner of Appella Advisors. And Andrew will be joined uh, with great pleasure by Spencer Dale, who is the Group Chief Economist at BP. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over and say a huge thank you to you and enjoy. Uh, thank you, John. And hello, everybody, and welcome again to this uh, Reuters Future of Energy event. Uh, my name is Andrew Brown, and I'm a partner at Reputation Advisory Firm Appella, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Um, 2020 is a year that will live long in the memory, the year that because of the virus, everything literally changed. But in time, perhaps 2020 will also be remembered as a year that business finally got climate change. You know, we've seen a veritable arms race of organisations, both large and small, pushing ahead, moving faster with their climate change agenda and net zero commitments. And of course, who can not forget the target of 2060 to be net zero by China, a genuine wow moment. The fact is what responsible business wouldn't want to target a future where they're no longer contributing to climate change. The question clearly is how? Should you take a tactical approach, making small incremental improvements now and then waiting to see how government action and technology innovation play out before you make those major investments? Or perhaps a strategic approach. You, know, you act ahead of regulation for risk mitigation and for market differentiation purposes. Ultimately, each business needs to determine their own optimal pathway to net zero, having considered the various risks and opportunities. One firm that has very recently set out its own ambitious pathway is BP. And, and as John said, to find out a little more about the journey they're on, we're joined by their chief economist, Spencer Dale. Hi. Spencer is, hello Spencer. Spencer is the group chief economist at BP and he manages their global economics team, advises their board and he provides economic input into the firm's commercial and strategic decisions. His team also produces the annual statistical review of world energy and the energy outlook. And he joined BP in 2014 from the Bank of England, where he was their chief economist and also a member the Monetary Policy Committee. Before I hand over to Spencer, if you would like to ask a question, please use the facility below. You can actually vote if you want to force a question to the top of the list. I'm sure we'll have lots. Um, so with that, I will uh, welcome Spencer and hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and, and thank you, John, uh, both of you for the invitation to participate in, in this event. Um, and thank you everybody for sparing the time to join me today. Um, just a little bit about BP. I want to spend most of my time talking about the energy and the energy system, but just a little bit about BP since you set it up in that way, Andrew. We, we earlier this year set out an ambition to be a net zero company. Now, what, what net zero means is a, is a difficult and complicated beast and we could spend the rest of the day talking about that. And there's many different aspects to our net zero commitment, but the heart of it, if you like, the real heart of our net zero commitment is that the net carbon emissions from the oil and gas that we extract from the ground will be net zero. That's our ambition. And the only way you could, the, 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 uh, the carbon emissions from the oil and gas you extract from the ground can be net zero is one of three things. Either A, you capture those carbon emissions when the oil and gas is burnt, most obviously using carbon capture, use and storage. Secondly, in a net sense, you can offset those carbon emissions via other things like natural climate solutions, or ultimately you just produce an awful lot less oil and gas. And that's what BP has committed to. It's committed to reducing its oil and gas production by 40% over the next 10 years. So not just a small tactical play, a very significant pivot in the next 10 years, and it will go to net zero um, by 2050. More than happy to talk about more aspects of BP if people would like. Um, my role in, in helping shape that strategy was to think about how the global energy system may change 
over the next 30 years and that we use that to help shape um, our strategy which is uh, which we're going to use to try and achieve um, that ambition and so what I wanted to do is just literally show about three or four slides about how we are viewing the energy transition and how um, that view was then fed into um, our uh, BP's strategy and hopefully that will um, create enough uh, differences of view and, and controversy for people to, um, to post um, their questions. So John if we put the slides up Thank you. Um, BP each year for the last uh, 10 years has been producing something called the Energy Outlook, which looks at the forces shaping uh, the energy system uh, over the next 20 um, or, or 30 years. And this year, um, we coincided the publication of our Energy Outlook um, to the publication of BP strategy, since the Energy Outlook was, 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 was fundamental in helping to shape um, that strategy. If we go to the next slide, uh, John. The, the outlook, uh, the whole the entire outlook is framed in, in terms of three particular scenarios and they're shown here and the scenarios here are shown in the context of what the, the implications for, for carbon emissions. So that rapid scenario shown in orange assumes a very significant increase in carbon prices together with a range of other climate policies, which together means carbon emissions uh, from energy use fall by around 70% um, by 2050. The blue net zero scenario assumes that those policies, carbon prices and other climate policies in, in, in RAPID are built on by a significant shift in consumer behavior and preferences. And those shifts in consumer behavior and preferences further accentuate the fall in carbon emissions, such that, as the name suggests, it, it, uh, in, uh, carbon emissions in the net zero scenario are almost entirely eliminated by 2050. The final scenario is that green business as usual scenario, which assumes that the pace of, of, of policy, technological progress and preferences continue to improve at the same rate as they've done in the recent past. That rate of improvement is, is enough for carbon emissions to peak by the mid 2020s, but you can say, can you see relatively little progress is made in terms of decarbonizing the energy system. Carbon emissions are only about 10% lower than, than, than their current levels by 2050. Now, all of these scenarios are wrong, okay? None of them will be right. We can't predict the future. We know we can't predict the future. We don't spend any time in the outlook trying to guess which of these is more or less likely. What's the probabilities of any of these happening? They're all going to be wrong. But what we use these scenarios for is to help better shape the uncertainty, to, to, to help us better understand the uncertainty we face. If we can better understand the uncertainty we face as a, as a company, then um, uh, we can then design a strategy which is robust and resilient. To, to that uncertainty. And I will show you in a, in a minute how, how precisely we, we go about doing that. One thing just to put these charts, uh, these scenarios in context is um, when thinking about the implications for temperature and, 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 and the Paris climate goals, that depends on the pathway of all greenhouse gases out to 2100. All we're looking at here is carbon emissions from energy use out to 2050. So we can't map directly from these scenarios to their implications for climate change and the Paris goals. But what we can do is use, and we show in the booklet, how we can compare these scenarios with the scenarios included in the 2019 IPCC report, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. That includes a vast range of scenarios which do cover all greenhouse, gas, um, greenhouse gases and go out to 2100. And if you move to the next chart, John, what this slide does is compare our scenarios with those IPCC scenarios. That pink swathe you can see there is the range of IPCC scenarios, which is consistent with maintaining temperature rises well below two degrees C. And you can see our rapid scenario um, is pretty much in the middle of that pink swathe. And in fact, is spookily close to the median IPCC scenario. 
So in that sense, you can think of rapid as being broadly consistent with, with maintaining temperature rises well below two degrees C. If you compare the net zero with the blue swathe, that shows a range of IPCC scenarios consistent with maintaining temperature rises below one and a half degrees. And you can see that the pace at which carbon emissions decline in, in the net zero scenario is slightly slower at first, but by the end of the outlook is, is in the lower half of that blue swathe. And so in that sense, we think of the net zero scenario as being broadly consistent with maintaining temperature rises below one and a half degrees C. So there's enormous uncertainty in terms of um, uh, what's going to happen in terms of the energy transition, in terms of the pace, speed and nature of that energy transition. And as I say, all these scenarios are going to be wrong. So how do they help us um, set a strategy? One way they can help us set a strategy is if we can, th if we can identify trends in energy demand, which are common across all three scenarios. Now, the scenarios are, aren't by any means comprehensive but if we can see some trends which are common across all three of these scenarios they range pretty much from the from a business as usual case to, to a one and a half degree net zero by 2050 case if we see some trends which are common across all three of them that may give us some confidence that the energy that energy that these trends may um, may materialize in some form over the next 30 years and that's shown in this next chart where we identify three, chart, three trends in particular. So if you bring up the next chart, John. So if we read this chart from, from left to right, so if you think of the first panel on the left, the first trend which is common across all three scenarios is the share of fossil fuels in primary energy declines very significantly. So the share of fossil fuels today, so oil, gas, uh, natural gas and coal, accounts around 85% of primary energy. In all three of those scenarios, that shares declines to somewhere between 65% and 20%. What is really striking is that in all three of these scenarios, the absolute demand for fossil fuels declines over the next 30 years. That would be entirely and utterly uh, unprecedented. If you look back in the history of energy, we've never seen the decline of, the, of, the, of consumption for any traded fuel. So the share of, of coal in primary, energy, in primary energy has declined over time. The share of oil in primary energy has declined over time, but we've never seen the, the absolute fall in the consumption of any of those um, fuels. In all three of these scenarios, we're seeing the absolute demand for, for all, to, for all um, fossil fuels declining over the next 30 years. So we're moving into uncharted territories. The second tre trend is that declining share of fossil fuels is largely replaced by an increasing share of renewable energy. So for the purposes of this exercise, renewable energy account it reflects wind and solar power, bioenergy and geothermal power. We model hydropower separately, so this does not include hydropower. As defined, renewables today account for around 5% of, of primary energy. And that increases to somewhere between 20 and 60 percent in all three of these uh, in three, three of these scenarios. In all three of these scenarios, renewables penetrate the energy system more quickly than any fuel ever seen in history. So the pace at which renewables gain share in terms of primary energy is quicker than any fuel ever seen in history. So again, in all three of these scenarios, unprecedented speed of change in terms of the energy system, in terms of the growth of renewables. And this third trend, which again is common across all three scenarios, is an increasing share of electricity in total final energy consumption as the world continues to electrify. And so when we're thinking about our strategy, in terms of energy demand, we had these three core beliefs which underpin our strategy. First, that the, 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 the demand for fossil fuels or the, the role of fossil fuels is likely to be very challenged over the future. That, and, and second, there'll be very significant growth in renewables energy, and that will go hand in hand with an electrification of the energy system. So a set of core beliefs relating to energy demand coming out of the outlook. The one other slide I wanted to do was say, how do we also use the outlook to think about how the structure of global energy markets may change over time. So this is demand. I want to think about how global energy markets may change 
as and when we see a shift to a lower carbon energy system. And to do that, I want to focus on the rapid um, scenario uh, in this next slide, if you bring it up, John. So the, to be clear here, I don't want to focus on the precise profiles of rapid. There's nothing special about the rapid scenario. The rapid scenario will be wrong. What I want to do at is try and bring out some generic features of the rapid scenario, which we think will be common across many scenarios as and when we see a shift to a low carbon energy um, system. Now, this chart is very different to the ones I've shown you up to now because it starts in 1900. Okay, so I'm showing you a big swathe of history here. As, as well as the next 30 years in terms of the future. And the reason why I want to do that is I want to contrast the future um, with what we've seen in the history in terms of the energy system. And if you look back in the history of, of, of modern energy, uh, much of that period has been dominated by one or two fuels. So um, if for the first half of the last century, energy system was dominated by coal, shown here in that very large share um, um, uh, for coal in, in shown in the black line. As a share of coal declined in the 60s and 70s, you saw the increasing dominance of oil shown in that green line. If you look ahead of the next 30 years, that system of just one or two dominant energy, uh, uh, one or two forms of energy completely changes with a far more diverse fuel mix for the next 20 or 30 years with oil, natural gas, uh, wind and solar power, coal, other non-fossil fuels, all, all providing significant amounts of world energy. With, with, with that choice of energy mix increasingly being driven by customer choice rather than the availability of fuels. If, you're, if we were living in the 1920s today, in the 1920s, we didn't have much option about what fuel to consume. It was coal or coal. Going forward, we're gonna have increasing um, choice of, of that, uh, about which fuels we, like, uh, we expect to, uh, we, we choose to use. Those increasing diversity of fuels are likely to need greater integration across those fuels. We think there's an increasing role for companies that can provide services in terms of integration across these different fuels. We think these fuels, these, these energy markets are also likely to become increasingly localized as we see the increasing role of electricity and further out hydrogen. Those energy carriers are more costly and less efficient to transfer to transport long distances and so that makes markets more localized. And the final point, but really significant point, is we think global energy markets are likely to become more competitive. Some of that competition reflects increasing competition across fuels. If you were a coal producer in the 1920s, you didn't really have to worry about competing against other fuels. You were the only game in town. Um, now, if you go forward into the 20s and 30s, 2020s and 2030s, if you're a coal producer and you want your coal um, used in, in a power sector, you're going to increasingly have to compete against natural gas, wind, solar, um, uh, and um, uh, nuclear energy, other non-fossil fuels to, to, um, to, um, to secure your demand. So far greater competition across fuels and also far greater competition within fuels, particularly for, the, for resource owners of, of coal, natural gas, and, and, and oil, as they compete to ensure that their resources are, are, ex, are, are extracted and, and consumed against a backdrop of falling um, any demand for their products. So this increasing competition, both across fuels and within fuels, leading to a shift in, 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 in economic rents away from the, from the upstream producers. Some of that may stay in the downstream, particularly for customers that help, uh, for companies helping to provide integration services across these fuels, but much of that economic rent flowing to, to consumers in the form of more competitive, lower priced um, energy. And this change in the, in the structure of energy markets underpins the second set of core beliefs, which underpin BP strategy, which if you like, if, sort of the, the way to think about this is a sort of shift in the center of gravity of energy markets away from upstream producers increasingly to consumers with greater diversity of choice, more integrated energy markets, more localized energy markets, and importantly, far more competitive energy markets with economic rents shifting away from the upstream, some to the downstream and increasingly to consumers. So that's some of the core beliefs which underpin BP's um, strategy and how we went about thinking about it in terms of the energy outlook. 
John, if we stop the slides now and hand back to Andrew, and then hopefully that's provoked uh, enough uh, controversy and disagreement to, um, to have the questions firing in. Uh, uh, thank you, Spencer. There's some fascinating insights there. Um, and the questions are coming in. Um, so as a reminder, please use the Ask Question facilities at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you'd like to put a question, Spencer, if you can, please state your name and organisation. If not, that's fine. But while we do that um, and, and let people have a little bit of time, Spencer, I do have a few questions of my own, if I may. I think one of the things I, I find I staggering is the amount of renewable uh, generation that's going to come on or needs to come on over the coming years. You spoke about 5% at the moment, then 20 then 60%. So where, where is the investment in renewable energy going to be focused in the coming years and why? So, yes, we, we expect to see a, we expect to see a very significant or we expect to see a very significant increase in investment in renewable energy in all three of those scenarios. In that rapid and net zero scenario, the pace uh, of investment is increasing two or three folds from what we've seen uh, uh, in the recent past. So the level of investment um, is sort of averaging between 500 and 750 billion dollars a year. In, in terms of wind and solar. That's the sort of numbers um, you're talking about, two or three times more than, than the, the levels we've seen at the moment. Now, at one level, those numbers seem eye-bogglingly eye high. You think, oh my goodness, how can that be achieved? Yes, that's a very significant increase. Another way of thinking about it though, that's roughly about 3% of business investment last year. Okay, that's what it is. Uh, and it's three percent of business investment to under to to uh, to achieve a very significant shift in our energy system that we need to see if we're going to get off the current unsustainable path. So this is entirely doable if there's sufficient collective will. The one point here, and we may want to get into it in more detail, is much of this growth in renewable energy is coming in in the developing world. It's because that is a developing world where power markets, so power demand, electricity demand is growing very substantially. And also you're seeing a big significant gain in the share of wind and solar power as a use of coal um, declines. And so what we need to do is not only do we need to mobilize those funds to, to the renewable sector, we need to mobilize those funds to the renewable sector in emerging markets. They're those same emerging markets that are getting really significantly badly affected by COVID at the moment. And so I think that's a, a, a sort of financing challenge. It's, it's quite possible to overcome it, but it's large sums of money which need to flow to these emerging markets because they are the markets that we need to help decarbonize by seeing very rapid growth in renewable energy. And what are the primary drivers of that? You know, are they push factors? Are they pull factors? You know, what's driving that? And, and, and arguably, how can that be given the scale of the challenge that we're facing? How could that be accelerated? So the, the, the sort of a simple way of thinking about why does renewable energy grow so rapidly is two bits. One is power demand, electricity demand, particularly in those developing markets, is growing very rapidly. So the pie is getting bigger in terms of electricity because all of this renewable energy is being used to generate electricity. And the second component is, is the share of wind and solar power in that power generation is increasing very rapidly, particularly at the expense of coal. And what's the primary driver of that now? I'm very pleased to say the primary driver of that is just pure competition, it's pure economics. The cost mm -hmm. of wind and solar power has fallen so dramatically over time that increasingly around the world, it can compete uh, on, on its own two feet, if you like, against um, a um, new build wind, a new build gas, and new build coal fired power stations. So, part of this is, is competition. There can be help. So, governments, um, in, governments for, for in, in many parts of the world have done various types of contracts, often in the form of long term purchasing power agreements, so um, PPAs. And what that does is essentially a, a commitment to buy that wind and solar power from the um, from the wind and solar power producer at a guaranteed price for the next 20 or 30 years. And that provides um, a great form of security. It also allows all sorts of financing options to become available. So I think there are sources of government help, but increasingly mm. this, is, this is possible because just wind and solar costs are coming down so much, they can just compete directly against other forms of energy. You, you've spoken a lot about wind and solar. We're getting quite a few questions now. So I'm gonna just, uh, flip to some of those. Uh, quite a few questions about hydrogen. 
Um, so Simon Vaughan asked about how do you see the role of hydrogen in matching renewable energy generation with consumer demand? But a question from um, Christopher Bonnert at Siemens around when do you see hydrogen becoming an economical business case? And also a question from Dr. Evart uh, Dumarshi, apologies if I pronounced that incorrectly, uh, asking about the differences between grey, blue and green hydrogen. You might want to explain what the differences are. And then that might then lead on also to questions about carbon capture and storage, but um, okay. lo lots of interest in hydrogen. <laughs> Good, and, and I think that's, that's sort of when sometimes people say, what's changed over the last two or three years? What's different? And, and I think it, it is, and, and people that have been in this industry far longer than I uh, will, will yawn a little bit and say, well, we've seen, we've been around this course before, but there, is, uh, there has been, I think, an explosion of interest in hydrogen and the role that hydrogen can play. And the intuition for this is, if you were to sit down with a piece of paper and they said, Andrew, write down the steps you need to do to decarbonize the energy system. Step one is you, you would you decarbonize the power sector. So you produce carbon free electricity and you electrify everything you possibly could. OK, that's that's your first step. And that will get you a long way um, if you just decarbonize the power sector and electrify everything. But there are some things which can't be easily electrified. Um, high temperature heat processes in industry, for example, mm. is very high, hard to use electricity to do that. Long distance transportation, particularly long distance road transportation, marine transportation, hard um, to, to electrify. And that's where you have a role um, for hydrogen, um, where hydrogen can be, can complement electricity going and um, being used um, di uh, uh, directly in transport, um, where we see sort of particularly see um, the growth of hydrogen uh, and fuel cell trucks, long distance road haulage trucks, and also um, uh, hydrogen being used in, in heavy industry to help the decarbonization of heavy industry. I think one of those questions was, do we also see a role for hydrogen as a sort of balancing uh, yes. uh, term uh, for um, within the, the power sector? And the, the intuition here is, if you, if you, if when the sun's shining very brightly, you've got too much solar power to use now, you can use some of that um, to produce hydrogen. And I'll explain how that in a minute. And you then that, if you like, hydrogen just acts as a sort of natural storage device, like a huge battery, which you can then put back in. We do see a role for hydrogen as well in power. But for us, we sort of see um, initially the biggest markets being in terms of industry and, and transportation. Somebody was saying, when is this like? to happen in, in our outlooks um, we see the growth of hydrogen in sort of post 2035 it's in the second half of the outlook in those rapid and net zero scenarios we don't see a material growth in business as usual um, but we do see in, in rapid um, and net zero and we see um, roughly um, over the next 30 years by, by 2050 roughly half of that as blue hydrogen and half as, as green hydrogen and I'll explain what that means so today the vast majority of hydrogen is, is so-called grey hydrogen so that's typically made with fossil fuels but you're not capturing the carbon emissions associated um, with producing that hydrogen and that hydrogen is often used as a feedstock to produce chemicals or produce fertilizers but that's polluting the atmosphere there are two ways of making uh, what I would call clean hydrogen. First, uh, what's termed by many is green hydrogen. And green hydrogen is you use renewable power and to create electricity, and then you create the hydrogen via electrolysis of water. So the electrolysis of water separates um, um, the hydrogen from the water using that renewable power, and that's green hydrogen. Hydrogen is made typically by extracting the hydrogen from natural gas and capturing the carbon emissions via carbon capture use and storage and storing that, that um, uh, um, and, and storing the carbon emissions. Today, in most parts of the many parts of the world, blue high, both blue and green hydrogen are very expensive relative to their substitutes, but blue hydrogen starts at a cost advantage relative to green. But we expect green hydrogen, the cost of green hydrogen to fall more rapidly over the next 30 years partly because renewable energy gets cheaper, but partly because we're gonna get better and better at producing the electrolyzers you need to do that. And so um, we sort of see this cost advantage gradually between blue and green gradually erode 
and then and then by the end in green hydrogen increasingly taking share but to the extent we can model this my sort of line is you know it's 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 by 2050 50 50 it may be 40 60 or 60 40 the point here is is not 90 10 or 10 um, 90 and a key point here is the blue hydrogen is quite important in allowing the hydrogen economy to come on on stream at pace and at scale without relying too heavily on renewable energy. If I relied solely on renewable energy, that amount of investment I would need to see in wind and solar power would be even more than that 500 and 750 billion. It'd be even more than two or three times. And sort of one of my, one of the things I, I carry around in the energy transition is any sort of sense that there's a, there's a single technology that will solve this problem, I just very worry, I worry deeply about. This, this problem is so large and so, and, and, and so immense, we will need all the, all the tools in our toolbox. So if we can make blue hydrogen and green hydrogen, both of them clean in terms of their carbon emissions, we should embrace both of them. I'm fascinated to, to, to you know, one, one of the biggest challenges is, is decarbonizing home heat around the world. And you know a number of, of markets around the world are talking about hydrogen replacing natural gas, um, particularly in, in colder countries. I'm interested. You BP said that you see hydrogen being mainly used in business and in 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 in, um, in transportation. Yeah. So there there is a um, uh, there is a potential role for for hydrogen, and and I think the 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 home heat issue is is a is a sort of a fascinating issue and a significant issue and again to simply oh, we're grossly oversimplifying this there's sort of two ways um or two or two key ways of doing this one is you you your home heating switch to to electricity you switch away from from natural gas and you lose electricity particularly with heat pumps um and and that provides your main form of heating the alternative is is you repurpose the gas pipelines which um, exist today, such that they can reduce use hydrogen, and then you put hydrogen into uh, and as your source rather than as a sort of substitute for that natural gas. I think if you were starting from a from a, a a blank field and designing a city from scratch, I think you would start with I think you would go quite clearly with um, electricity and heat pumps. For for some parts of sort of Europe and the developed world where you're starting with mass gas pipelines and, um, and gas boilers in, in many houses, I think it becomes less clear. I don't think it becomes obvious you go, definitely go the hydrogen route, but it becomes less obvious that then you start from there. And this is just, you know, history matters here. That we do, for, you know, for much of the Western world, we're not starting from a clean piece of paper. Although for much of the developing world in terms of urbanization, we are. And so, and that's, I think it will be an electrification route rather than the hydrogen route. Fascinating. I, I, the other thing that the, uh, the, the blue, green, gray hydrogen requires on, particularly for, 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 uh, for blue is carbon capture and storage. And you touched on that in your presentation as well about, you know, getting to net zero requires carbon to be captured. It, there've been so many false starts around the world and many question whether the technology will ever actually happen. I was wondering how much your model is predicated on CCS achieving its ambitions or whether it is a tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Yeah, so um, in our outlook, um, uh, uh, carbon capture use and storage gets in rapid, it gets about four gigatons of, of CO2 is captured and, and in, in um, net zero it gets to about five gigatons. For those who don't carry these numbers around, um, the level of carbon emissions from energy sector today are about 32 gigatons. So it's a little over sort of 10%, 10 to 15% is what it's uh, uh, capturing. It's an interesting question about CCUS because when I say we're going to increase investment in renewables by two or three times, and it's five to 750 billion, most people just say, well, why, why isn't it more than that, Spencer? Why not more than that? And then when I say, well, we're going to do four to five gigatons of CCUS, they say, well, that's a big number. But what's fascinating is if you look at any sort of systems modeling that I've seen of, of decarbonizations, a decarbonization with carbon capture use and storage is far, far cheaper than any other form. So the economic case for this is huge and clear. 
the geology needed to store four or five gigatons of of, of carbon uh, of carbon is 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 huge. I mean, that, there's just there's almost not almost infinite, but the, the geology dwarfs uh, the available uh, geology dwarfs four or five gigatons. And the amount of the average levels of investment, you know, I was talking about that 500 to 700 billion uh, trillion uh, billion dollars for renewables is about 100 for CCUS. So the scale of investment here isn't great. So I think, um, but your case is, well, why isn't it being built at the moment, Spencer? Because there's, clear, because there's just no government incentives and very few government incentives around the world to enable this to happen. One of the things I think collectively the world has done uh, for, for wind and solar power, it provided sort of um, safety nets or, or um, safety boundaries which allowed wind and solar power to achieve scale before they had to compete on a on a light for light basis and there's good economic reasons for allowing infant technologies to achieve scale before you expose them to hard competition mm. we've seen no no we, almost no similar types of mechanisms available for carbon capture use and storage so i hope carbon capture use and storage plays a role and i think it, i think i put it the other way andrew is we get to 10 years time and we're not seeing a significant rollout of carbon capture use and storage i think we should be worried mm. we should be worried either because um we've, we're following a very inefficient path of decarbonization or we should be even more worried because we're still not on a path for decarbonization you you, you, just, you just touched on there about the role of government and how important governments were in the subsidy frameworks that they put in place for renewables particularly wind and solar um, and we, we're getting quite a few questions through about just scrolling through about um, you know what are the roadmaps or programs that can realize this transformation you know what what is what is the role of public leaders who's driving things uh, another question that we came about you know what might happen with, with, with the elections and with various changes of government I, I think you know what is the role of government you know many governments have talked about post-COVID is the perfect opportunity to rebuild the world's economy in a more environmentally and climate friendly way. I suppose, let me try and phrase the, the question that people have asked. If you were in charge, uh, 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 Spence, if you are president or prime minister for the day, what would you do to rebuild back better? What, how would you, uh, you know, put energy into this, uh, pun intended, uh, you know, the roadmap to, 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 you know, to what could government do if, if, if you were in charge? Yeah, so I think, um, I think I'd start by doing a commitment to raise carbon prices um, gradually, predictably, but persistently for a long period of time to get carbon prices up to a, a meaningful uh, level. And that, um, and the reason why carbon prices um, sort of works, if we, we want to, if we want to ration something, we know from Economics 101, the best way of rationing it is to put a price on it. That encourages everybody, producers, consumers, investors, entrepreneurs, to find the cheapest way of reducing carbon emissions. If I really was prime minister for the day, I may take off the shelf, the, um, the, the report that the group of 30 published last week under the um, authorships of Mark Carney and Janet Yellen, where they um, had a similar path for carbon um, prices, but they actually said that the responsibility for setting those carbon prices should be given to a carbon independent carbon council. So you could really trust them, just like you trust an independent central bank to set mm. interest rates. You could set, you could allow, um, and you could have a carbon council to do that. So I think I was. That's not a bad start. I think I would take the opportunity of build back better to what we are seeing in terms of COVID is the scale of government interventions um, uh, are, are, are unprecedented. That allows us a, an opportunity to um, uh, target those interventions into types of growth which are likely to, to, to grow in terms of in a sustainable green way. And there's an increasing amounts of evidence to show that that not only is good in terms of long-term sustainability, but is also, also good for short-term um, growth. And if you if you don't mind, Andrew, I do two more things. No, no, but uh, you're prime minister for the day. Uh, you can do whatever you want. Uh, I do two more things. Third, um, in terms of that home, I would start to build a constituency for 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 sustainability and for people caring about climate change. There's a limit 
to what governments can do by pulling their, their levers. Per, first of all, you can only pull a lever so hard. And the political legitimacy of pulling levers it, um, is limited if there's not widespread support and under, underpinning for that. And that was why I was saying the big thing that got you from the from the orange rapid scenario to that to the blue net zero scenario was a shift in, in preferences. When I was my previous life, you said I was at the Bank of England. When we introduced inflation targeting, we 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 built a program. It's like a ten-year program to build a constituency for low inflation. I think we would need to build widespread support uh, in in favour of sustainability and reducing carbon emissions. And so people's behaviours start to change on their own accord, rather than purely in response to price incentives. And the final thing would be to say, I can't just worry about myself and my own country. I really need to worry about the emerging world. The emerging world is where all of the growth of energy demand will come in the next 20, 30 years. Those emerging economies um, are where all the growth we will see in terms of gross sense of carbon emissions is likely to come from those economies. And those economies are, are the ones that have been most severely affected um, by um, COVID and are likely to be um, significantly put back by COVID. And so we have an opportunity here about what we're going to do. I think a really bad outcome um, is we do nothing for those economies, in which case we just lose a generation in terms of growth. Um, better, but still very bad for the environment is we do see growth in those economies, but they're not wealthy enough to adopt new technologies and then use old technologies. And so they carry on using dirty, um, inefficient forms of energy, and that would just make car carbon uh, emissions even greater. So I guess my message here, and I think I'd go to, I would try and speak to my, the leaders of the developed world is many of us are talking a good game in terms of what we're going to do in our own economies. It's not enough mm. um, because we're ignoring where much of the action needs to take place. And so we need to also divert some of our energies and attention to those emerging economies, helping sure that they are also able to recover, but recover growth in a, in a green and sustainable way. Sorry, I'm a very greedy prime minister. No, 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 that's, that's, that's what I say, what you're in charge. Just um, a question just around the model, I, I, so a couple of people asked, why was hydropower modeled separately? Largely because um, its dynamics are so different to all the others. So particularly wind and solar power are growing very rapidly. And um, hydropower um, growth rate is far slower. And so what I was trying to pick up is this rapid growth in these sort of um, these in these wind, particularly in wind and solar power, but also in in bioenergy. Um, and if I looked at hydropower, the average growth rate would just be a lot slower. And so you, I just, it would just sort of um, dull some of that um, uh, uh, signal that I'm getting to invest my money in quotes renewables and where, where, where particularly that renewables is wind, solar and bioenergy. That's where, that's where the really rapid growth, so if you like, you can call it rapid growth renewables and slower growth renewables. But we just, it's for that reason, not because it's not important, it's just because I just wanted to highlight those bits which are really growing rapidly and transforming the energy system. And, and another, th thank you, and then another, uh, quite a few questions to rattle through. Uh, an, an anonymous person has asked about what role can solar thermal play? A lot of the discussion has been about electricity and electrification. Uh, solar thermal? Yes, I, um, I, we're going to quickly get out of my depth in terms of my engineering <laughs> knowledge. Um, the truthful answer is we don't think it's playing a significant role. It's not playing a significant role in these in, in these outlooks. And we're not assuming sort of the technology progress that we assume here isn't sort of breakthrough technology progress. It's sort of, um, if you like, it's, um, it's moving down learning curves. It's becoming increasingly efficient at producing things as you produce more and more of them. And so we don't have um, solar thermal playing a big role here, but uh, but I, that may well be used because we're not thinking hard enough about it rather than we thought deeply, deeply about it and, and dismissed it. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to come on to um, some questions on R&D in a minute, but we've had a question from uh, Professor Pizzoni, I hope that's how you pronounce it, who's at Nottingham University, who's talking about um, the oil majors working together. He said that BP, Shell, Total, and Equinor clearly going in a different direction to Chevron and, and ExxonMobil. Um, you know, why Why are, isn't there more working together given how serious the situation is, um, according to, to, to most scientists? So I, um, 
there's all sorts of laws about working together in terms of cartels and um, and that's a tricky thing i think um you know in any in any business setting the different people have different views about how they think they should run their businesses and and, and it's sort of in a sort of um in in a, in a world of um, sort of open free capital markets it's quite hard to uh for people to um to force people to to work together we are certainly trying to build coalitions with other um oil and gas companies we just entered for example uh, a strategic partnership with equinor in terms of offshore wind so we certainly uh are are open to those types of strategic partnerships but ultimately um different companies will will see the future in a different way and they will um approach that differently and then and i can understand the professor's point of view well surely the power of this would be so much greater if you all got together and i can see see that and that will be attractive the other thing is i quite like the idea that none of us know what the right answer is here and so um if we all got together and, and said look we know what the answer is let's do this that'd be great if we were right but it'd be pretty frightening if we, we turned out to be wrong this way you know even so the professor's right in the sense there's a greater similarity between those sort of european countries uh, companies in terms of bp shell total equinor but if you look at the details of the strategies they're all quite different there's a very different strategy we were pursuing different ideas now who knows what's right and what's wrong and in some sense i think for the world a diversified approach in terms of how energy companies are responding isn't isn't a bad thing as long as they are responding now if then if they're, they're not responding i can understand why that raises more concerns but in terms of the com companies i mentioned i think they are all responding they're just responding in a different way thank you thank you for that and i hope that answered um, your question well a few questions on on r d particularly r d around hydrogen our advice for companies looking to do r d i, I think one of the areas that, that i was wanting to talk about was was the fact that you know the one and a half degree pathway cut looks technically achievable to 2030 but then for most businesses beyond then it looks more challenging um you know you need more technological process related innovation and so therefore the next 10 years of r d are critical we sort of touched on ccs and some of the more the other the innovations going on i was just wondering what's the extent to which um, you know, BP is investing in R&D, reference some of the questions we've been asked. And then your willingness, the professor's uh, question, how willing are you to share those innovations, given the fact that we are all in this together um, and, you know, it's a climate change that is affecting everybody? And are there particular areas of R&D that, 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 that BP are, are, are interested in, excited in, hopeful about? Sort of broad, encompassing question there, Spencer. Yes. Um... I, there are different ways of thinking about this and, and different people have different views. My, my starting point here is we, we're not, we don't need a technological breakthrough to achieve net zero. The main components of what we need to achieve net zero exist today. We know how to decarbonize the power sector. We know how to electrify things. We know how to make blue and green hydrogen. We know how to um, and capture um, carbon emissions with CCUS. The cost of those technologies will all fall over time as we do more and more of them. The challenge we face isn't that we need some light bulb moment and we all just need to wait around hoping for a light bulb moment. The challenge we face is to, is to um, apply those technologies at the pace and scale that we need to decarbonize the energy system. If we do that, the cost of those technologies will naturally just fall um, because we just get more and more efficient. So um, the issue here is not, I think, technology will save us or technology will, um, and unless it does, we're, we're doomed. This is up to us. The technologies in essence exist uh, and we just need to apply them at, at pace and at scale. Now that's not to say that we can get better and better and that, you, that sort of getting, you know, getting better and better at them is a whole series of small innovations and we um, do an active um, venturing program where we invest in a whole range of um, low carbon technologies and take uh, small positions in a whole variety of uh, uh, new startups and the attractiveness of that is, is two or threefold one is just being part of that venturing community means you just see the deal flow. So you just get a sense about where the new technologies are. 
some of those technologies you invest in work and you can scale up and that's very exciting some of them fail but in some sense even that's really interesting and that's very useful because if you thought that technology or that idea was sufficiently good that you're going to put millions of dollars of investment in it and it subsequently fails and like i don't run the venture fund so i can see this in a somewhat more philosophical thing that in itself is interesting why is it what is it what do i learn from the fact that something i thought was a, a viable business didn't work now um the I, I had one point had pushed quite hard was why can't we open up our venturing fund to others to invest in which is sort of your your point andrew yeah um and th it turns out that the main the main benefit we get from this venturing is not the capital value appreciation of the shares that we own in a company. So it's not by holding the company, taking an IPO and then taking the money. It's rather that we get those technologies early and then we can apply them in our business. So the, so the return accrues to us by having early access um, to, those, to those technologies, which is sort of flies it a little bit in the face of your make it available um, to all. Um, but that, that, in some sense, is, is sort of the business model, and it's quite hard to shift away, from, and it's a successful business model, because I don't need, because in some sense, that's one of the attractions of us investing in those businesses when we try and sell ourselves to those businesses. So they think, well, these guys um, gives us a market which we can exploit quickly. Um, the point I would stress in terms of making it available to all, BP's uh, um, ambition, I only talked about one path of the ambition. BP's ambition, is to become a net zero company by 2050 or sooner. That was that first bit I talked about at the beginning and to help the world get to net zero. And that second bit is absolutely critical. It's not just enough for us in our position to put our own debt chairs in order. That's, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. We start the power and the reach of BP means that we have to also play our role in helping get the world get to net zero. Part of that is in terms of advocacy. And, and doing our bit to ensure that we support uh, low carbon policies around the world. But part of it is also in terms of dissemination of low carbon technologies. And we have clear aims in, in these things to try and play our role. And in part, this is because getting to net zero if the world isn't anywhere close to getting net zero will be a pretty hard thing to do. And so these two things are symbiotic in that sense. And so we are committed to that that second aim just as much as the first part of the aim. As you said at the beginning, it, it's not one technology that's going to fix this. It's lots of technologies and many of those might not necessarily have been fully realized. So all of you uh, budding zero carbon businesses out there, you can address your business plans um, to Spencer Dale at BP. Um, <laughs> That's great, Spencer. Thank you. Um, one of the other questions I just wanted to touch on um, was, you know, potentially we might have a three or even four degree warming world. And some people have spoken about you know, we need an adaptation race as much as we're having a net zero race. I was just keen to understand what BP's views were on adaptation whilst also striving for um, net zero. And I think um, I'm not sure what BP's views are. So let me give you my views. I mean, um, I think adaptation will become increasingly important and we will need to see investments in, in adaptation and and when thinking about the risks associated uh, any, any company uh, any bank any company of any sort when you're thinking about the risk from climate change some of it is the value of the assets you hold are affected but also it's just the physical risk as we as we extreme weather events change and so on and so adaptation um, will be important in, and particularly in some parts of the world. My, my only hesitation here is, is adaptation is, um, is a way of buying time. It's not a solution. All it does is buy you time to, under, to, to, under, to achieve the real outcome, which is to get carbon emissions um, to zero. So my, my nervousness is if too much energy goes into adaptation, people may think, oh, okay, well, this is solving climate change. It, it's not, it's as if like, You've got um, you've got an illness and it's manifesting itself in a cut somewhere, and you put a bandage on it for a bit, and that's great, and it and it means that you you know you don't you you stem the bleeding for a bit, but that's but the, the underlying injury is still there and it's not going to go away, and ultimately the the bandage buys you some time to deal with the underlying cause, and and so adaptation is important and will be important, but it's not a cure, it's not the solution. It just buys you time to do the deep and real thing, which is get carbon emissions down to zero. 
fascinating. Thank, thank you, um, Spencer. I'm conscious of time. Um, and uh, we we promised to have everybody done by now. So my, my, the final question I, I wanted to ask, we sort of opened it with, you know, we're a year away from COP26. So Spencer, the role that you've got and, and, and your knowledge of the individuals involved, um, what is your one hope for COP that comes out of COP26? I, I think if it, if it is a one hope that we think of COP26 in the same way as we thought we think of Paris. It was a sort of it was a defining moment where we saw a significant shift. They, this was always supposed to be, as the COP26 was always supposed to be the point where people went back and they, we saw a significant ratcheting up of their nationally determined contributions, their, their, their levels of ambition. And this was the year, this was the COP, it was supposed to be this year, obviously now gonna be next year, but it was a year where we were going to see that very significant shift um, in the level of, of ambition. And so I hope that, that, that's, that, that that's what we'll see, that we'll come back and look at COP26 as another defining stage. And, and you talked about China's wow moment. And I, I do think it's important to recognize that, that, that uh, the, the China's announcement of carbon neutrality by 2060, all right, it's 2060, not 2050, but mm. that's a significant shift in, in the trajectory they're on. The, their previous um, target their nationally determined contribution was for carbon emissions to to peak by 2030 or, or sooner that was, they were on that trajectory so that that trajectory was never hugely ambitious they're not on a trajectory of carbon neutrality by 2060 this will need a fundamental shift even more fundamental shift than we've seen already in in, in the china's energy system so uh, hopefully that will set the way for others to 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 increase their levels of, of ambition and then we'll come to think of COP26 as significant as, as the Paris COP. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Um, and thank you, everybody, for the questions submitted. Apologies, we couldn't get to them all. Some of them were incredibly technical and I was conscious that Spencer is, is an economist and not an engineer. Thank um, you. But, 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 <laughs> but thank you, Spencer. Um, and thank you, everybody. I hope that it's been insightful and enjoyable. I've certainly enjoyed uh, talking to you, Spencer. And with that, back to John. Well, thank you very much to the both of you there. Thank you, Andrew, for leading a great discussion and Spencer for, for providing such a, a great presentation at the start and also for the detailed uh, questions that you were providing answers to. Um, I can see there's a lot of people still in the room and there's still people joining. So just to reiterate that the recordings will be going out to everyone again next week. So if there's things that you want to catch up on or um, anything that you wanted to re-listen to, we'll be putting that back out to everyone. But uh, a big thanks again to, to Andrew and Spencer. Thank you very much. And to everyone else, um, just to reiterate again, this is a part of the global energy series uh, today focused very much around um, renewables and the energy transition. If you are interested in what Reuters uh, events are doing in that area, please do head uh, to Google and punch in um, Reuters events, future of renewables to have a little look at what we are doing. But without further ado and without keeping anyone for too long, I'd like to say a very good evening, a very good night and a very good morning, depending on where you're based in the world. And we'll see oh, you again soon. You. Thank, you, Thank you very much. Thank you.